KSAC News and Public Affairs presents now an address by former U.S. Senator and human rights advocate Dick Clark, speaking on human rights in Africa, an American perspective. Senator Clark was the lead-off speaker in this year's Lou Douglas series, sponsored by the University for Man in Manhattan and the Kansas State University Department of Political Science. This year's series deals with perspectives on human rights, and we'll look specifically at human rights in Africa and Central and Latin America. Senator Clark was introduced by Dr. Michael Suleiman, head of the Kansas State University Department of Political Science. I would like to mention that uh, Professor Douglas served in the Political Science Department over 27 years. He was a great colleague to all of us, a great help to any student, as Sue mentioned, and was always active in community work. We are very pleased, in fact, to co-sponsor the series with the University for Man, as we will be doing this year and in the future. It is now my privilege and pleasure to introduce Senator Clark. Senator Clark was born and raised in Iowa and also received his education there. While Working for his Ph.D. at the University of Iowa, he was a teaching assistant, went on to study history and political science, and to teach both history and political science at Upper Iowa University. He then became involved in university administration and politics, was president of the university faculty in 62, and also served on several state commissions during this period, chairing the Iowa Civil Defense Administration and the Office of Emergency Planning in 1963 and 64. Then, from 65 to 72, he was administrative assistant to Iowa Second District Congressman John Culver, now Iowa senior senator. Then went on to run for political office himself and was elected to the U.S. Senate in 1972. Did this by traveling extensively across the state. In the Senate, Clark was a leader in the areas of foreign policy, congressional and campaign reform, and agriculture, and chaired subcommittees on African affairs and rural development. In 1974, Clark was named the Time Magazine, by Time Magazine, as one of the 200 leaders of the future. And in 1976, he was picked by the Wall Street Journal as one of the stars of the 94th, 94th Congress. Jack Anderson, the national columnist, selected Senator Clark as one of the 10 most effective members of the Senate the only freshman sen senator so named. In 1979, Common Cause, the citizens lobby, presented Senator Clark with an award for outstanding service in the public interest. Again, the only senator ever to receive such an award. After 1978, when he was unsuccessful in his bid for re-election, Senator Clark was ambassador at large and United States coordinator for refugee affairs for the Carter administration. Senator Clark, since then, has been active and a member of various boards, including AfriCare, Population Resources Council, American Committee on East-West Accord, the Peace Through Law Education Fund, and Benton Foundation. He is the author of several articles on foreign policy, has been awarded eight honorary degrees by various universities. Presently, Pitt Clark is a senior fellow of the Aspen Institute for Humanistic Studies, working primarily with former secretaries of state to study American foreign policy and come up with some suggestions about what that should be for the future. 
It is again my privilege and my honor to introduce to you former Senator Dick Clark, who will talk to us about human rights in general and specifically concerning Africa. Senator Clark. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for a, a most generous introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here and uh, particularly to be asked to speak to you about human rights, a topic which is being debated with great fervor in our government and indeed all across the country. Uh, in fact, it's difficult to imagine a topic that is more timely uh, or one that is more important. And I must say it's a particular pleasure uh, to be asked to give the Lou Douglas Lecture. Uh, not many people have the honor of having a lecture series named after them, and uh, I'm sure that it is a very deserving honor. It's a great tribute, I think, both to uh, Lou Douglas's scholarship and to him as a person, someone uh, who I think Sue said first uh, certainly was prepared to take on any tough issue locally or nationally, it's always toughest to take them on locally. It's much easier for someone to be in Washington and stand for an issue than it is to stand for an issue among your own uh, friends and neighbors and uh, colleagues. And so I uh, am particularly pleased uh, to be associated with his name. May I also say that I'm very much impressed uh, in looking at the catalog and talking pe with people about the University for Man. And uh, if I lived in Manhattan, I know that I would be a student. Uh, it looks fascinating. I hope that in the period that I'm here that I can learn more about it. But uh, those of you who were associated either with its founding or with its uh, participation, with its uh, operation, uh, certainly ought to be proud of, of that kind of, uh, of development. And I, I want also to thank the Political Science Department uh, for their sponsorship. Well, when I learned that uh, I would be the first speaker in this series on human rights, and there are to be, I think, three additional speakers uh, over this next few months, uh, when I learned that I would uh, be first, I took the liberty to broaden the topic a bit uh, so that I might talk about the history and development of human rights as such the concept of human rights, uh, particularly in the period uh, since World War II. And uh, I must say, to me, a, a background is, is essential to an understanding of human rights in any given part of the world. So uh, the first half of my remarks really will deal with the broad concept of human rights as such, and the last half uh, with American policy toward Africa, uh, particularly toward Southern Africa, which is a topic that has been of uh, major interest to me for the last several years. But first, uh, as I said uh, earlier, uh, there, there, uh, I would like to address myself to just to the broader issue of uh, how the human rights concept uh, has developed, at least in these last few years since World War II. As I said at the opening of my comments, uh, there is a great controversy as you well know, raging in the United States now concerning whether it is wise and appropriate to emphasize human rights in carrying out American foreign policy, whether that's the right course for us to take. One side argues that such an, em uh, such a, an emphasis is absolutely vital. They say that uh, it's basic to American society uh, and that our foreign policy should certainly reflect uh, our own most fundamental values, argue strongly for human rights. Uh, they say that uh, we must, certainly should at any rate, temper our relations with other countries abroad in simple recognition of the common humanity of all people, regardless of their nationality, regardless of what country they may live in. And further, this group would hold that the major distinction between our society and that of our adversaries 
is respect for freedom, for human rights, and civil liberties. But there are also many people in America who feel the very opposite. They say that uh, an emphasis on human rights is counterproductive, that it's based upon a kind of naive idealism which fails to recognize the hard realities of world affairs. We sometimes call such people advocates of uh, realpolitik or realistic politics. I happen to notice in the material that was sent to me, by the way, that Lou Douglas wrote a, an article on realpolitik. Well, it's the view of these opponents of human rights that the United States, after all, faces a life and death struggle for survival with the Soviet Union and that we cannot afford to alienate nations who support us uh, in that struggle simply uh, because they violate the human rights of their people. So this uh, dichotomy, human rights versus realpolitik, that's the dilemma that uh, many people are trying to work out in their own minds and that many people in Washington, certainly people in government, uh, are trying to resolve. Now, this is, I think, a particularly propitious time to review and examine our policy in this regard because, as you know, we're just witnessing or have just witnessed the, uh, the changing of the guard in Washington, in our national government. Um, the general consensus, I think, is that there will be a very significant change at the national level. Uh, perhaps, or at least some would say, the greatest ideological change uh, since the Great Depression, since uh, the Roosevelt election in 1932. Well, later I want to come back to, uh, to what this change may mean, this administration change may mean in terms of human rights. But first, let us look briefly at the development of uh, human rights in the period since the war, because I think it's, it's important to see it in this broader perspective. Now, a few weeks ago, about two months ago, as I recall, we celebrated the 32nd anniversary of the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, passed by the General Assembly, the United Nations. Now, this Universal Declaration contains some of the fundamental philosophy that's contained in our own Declaration of Independence and, indeed, contained in some of the principles of our own Bill of Rights. It includes the right to life, liberty, and the security of person, as well as equal protection under the law, freedom of religion, expression, of press and assembly, freedom from slavery and torture. These are guaranteed, as well as uh, rights to a fair trial, freedom from arbitrary arrest, and so forth. The Declaration, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. There is so much discussion these days about America's role in emphasizing human rights, that it is often forgotten that these rights are not an American invention. They are an essential part of international affairs. They originate with international treaties, which we and some of the other nations of the world, most of the other nations, I might say, have solemnly agreed to, agreed that we would abide by. The United States Charter, I should say the United Nations Charter itself, the, uh, the, the charter under which it uh, operates, which was adopted, of course, right after the war in 1945, states as a primary objective, quote, to reaffirm our faith in fundamental human rights, in the dignity and worth of the human person, in the equal rights of men and women and of nations large and small, end of quote. Human rights were further internationalized in the years following the founding of the United Nations by the adoption of various global conventions and uh, covenants spelling out these rights. I'm not going to go through all of them, but, but uh, ECASOC and uh, UNESCO and the International Labor Organization, all of them adopted codes, as did many other agencies. And I might point out that... Uh, such human rights treaties were not limited to these broad worldwide agreements either. Uh, regional organizations here in the Americas, 
uh, in Western Europe were also adopted. And uh, they set up mechanisms for investigating uh, reporting on rights violations. And indeed, in some cases, they have even now set up courts to adjudicate them. Now, these agreements are treaties. That's a point I want to make uh, very strongly. Ratified by the various governments. In our case, indeed, uh, debated and ratified by the United States Senate. Now, as you know, these treaties are not a statement of our national law, but there is a strong expectation that signatory states will abide by them. And furthermore, they are a part of international law, and that in itself even gives them some standing in our law. But the main point, I think, is that we have given our word that we would abide by these treaties just as with any other treaty that this country has entered into. Now, I've described these international agreements in some detail because America's participation in human rights must be seen in this broader international context, not just as something one country or one administration or one Congress can choose to pursue. Those who argue that emphasis by our government on human rights is unjustified because it is an attempt to make the world over in our own image, I think simply lacked historical perspective. There is nothing uniquely American about human rights, even though it is a basis of our own foundation. Virtually every nation in the world, from every culture, religion, and race, has become a public signatory to these recognized rights. Now, I hasten to add that, like international agreements and other subject matter areas, they're not always lived up to. Obviously, violations of internationally recognized rights are more often the case than the exception. A simple review of the violations by countries, as reported by Amnesty International and some of the other uh, monitoring organizations, reveal the broad extent and the common practice of human rights violations in every part of the world. My point is not that they are always observed everywhere. My point is that they are internationally recognized as a standard to live by. There is no nation on earth who disavows these standards. They may not live by them, but they do not disavow them. No one says that these principles of human rights are alien to their culture are too sophisticated for their society. The simple fact is that no member of the human race in any culture or state of development wants to be killed or tortured or, or, or persecuted or suppressed. The human condition surely is universal. Now, obviously, people who live under tyrannical governments often experience these terrible acts. But there is no evidence at all to indicate that those who suffer from these acts suffer any less pain or feel any less violated as human beings than would be the case with you or me. Now, I suppose that the degree of nationalism, or some might say chauvinism, that one harbors is very important in a question of this kind. If our concern for human beings and their welfare ends at the country's border, then what happens to others is none of our business, if one takes that view. If one holds this view, I think they have to also acknowledge that the Holocaust in Germany was Germany's business, and not ours, and not anyone else's. If, however, we accept a common humanity, then genocide is impossible to ignore, and so, I would argue, are gross violations of human rights. In my judgment, the best reason for integrating human rights into United States foreign policy is that human rights objectives do indeed reflect the moral and humanitarian values of the American people. Now, if these values are our values, why not promote them? 
They are certainly not distasteful to others in the world. I've never heard them described as distasteful, except, of course, uh, except, of course, by dictators who are themselves the violators of these human rights. I remember well speaking on the Senate floor in 1976, pointing out, um, or trying to point out to the Ford administration and to Secretary uh, Kissinger in particular, that it was clear that they were not reflecting American values in their own policy. Now, you will recall that uh, Secretary Kissinger felt, and indeed has, uh, feels to this day, as he often says, that uh, American emphasis on human rights is generally harmful to our national interest. It was because we were not able to get favorable consideration from that administration that I joined with Senator Hubert Humphrey in sponsoring legislation in the foreign uh, relations, uh, or I should say in the uh, uh, Foreign Assistance Act, to require that no economic or military assistance go, go, and I quote from the amendment here, go to the government of any country which engages in a consistent pattern of gross violations of internationally recognized human rights, except where such assistance will go directly to benefit the needy people in such a country, end of quote. Now, the amendment defined violations rather broadly to include, quote, torture or cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment, prolonged detention without charges and trial, and other flagrant denials of the rights of, uh, to life, liberty, or the security of the person, end of quote. Additionally, I might say, and this became very important and has now under the Reagan administration, we created a Bureau of Human Rights in the Department of State. In fact, it was called the Bureau of Human Rights and Humanitarian Affairs. And we put it at a very high level in the department with a director at the level of Assistant Secretary of State. In 1976, amendments to the Foreign Assistance Acts, Act, uh, which I mentioned a, a moment ago, set out very clearly, I think as clearly as has been done, the congressional intent in integrating human rights considerations into our foreign policy decisions. Now, let me quote just one line from that amendment, because I think it says most of it. A principal goal of the foreign policy of the, of the United States shall be to promote the increased observance of internationally recognized human rights in all countries, end of quote. And, of course, in that legislation, the Secretary of State was required to report to Congress on the observance of human rights in countries which receive assistance, which we give foreign aid to. Now, when in 1976, in the, in the election campaign of 1976, then, uh, Jimmy Carter seized upon the issue of human rights, it had a solid legislative foundation built already in the Congress. It was not invented in 1976. Nevertheless, from the very beginning of his administration, he took human rights quite seriously. One indication of that was his appointment of Patricia Darien to become the first Assistant Secretary of State for this newly created Bureau of Human Rights. She had been a leading activist in civil rights struggles in her home state of Mississippi and uh, proved to be a very courageous fighter for human rights around the globe and held that position throughout that four-year period. In his inaugural uh, address, President Carter said, quote, our commitment to human rights must be absolute because we are free. We can never be indifferent to the fate of freedom everywhere, end of quote. Well, as it turned out, as is so often the case, President Carter's commitment to human rights was not absolute, uh, as he had said it would be or should be. But perhaps uh, absolute adherence is, is, is too high a standard uh, to set. Uh, certainly, he and his administration did more than any predecessor has done, and uh, I believe that he's to be complimented for it. Now, we have not been perfect then, certainly, in our application of human rights in the last administration or at any other point. But the Carter administration is over, that period is behind us, and the Reagan administration is in power. 
At least for the next four years, President-elect Reagan and his subordinates will decide, along with the new Congress, what kind of importance to give to this issue of human rights. During the campaign, Governor Reagan made some general remarks about human rights. He uh, generally, when asked about the question, would say that he felt the Carter administration had gone too far in their emphasis and that his presidency would give greater importance to security interests. He's been particularly critical of uh, the Carter administration's failure to give greater support to uh, both the Shah of Iran and, uh, and Samosa in Nicaragua. Now, since his inaugural, President Reagan has taken actions which indicate that he has indeed no intentions of continuing the Carter uh, human rights policy. His warm welcome of the new strongman of South Korea uh, was clear evidence at the outset. Indeed, uh, he was honored by being the first major foreign leader invited to this country by the president. Uh, no public criticism was made of the Korean president's suppression of either political parties or opposition leaders. The decision to no longer pressure Chile to turn over witnesses in the Letalier assassination case is, I think, clearly further evidence. But uh, Mrs. Letelier, uh, as I understand it, is going to be here to speak about uh, this and other matters of human rights in Latin America, and certainly she can speak to this with more poignancy than I. Uh, apparently, at any rate, we are going to uh, not emphasize human rights in Chile. I noticed over the weekend that that message was not lost on the uh, dictatorship in Argentina where the government uh, arrested and, and held this last uh, Friday or Saturday uh, without charge, arrested and held without charge, uh, all of the country's leading human rights advocates. There are now some 6,000 people in Argentina who have simply disappeared over the last several months. Most significant of all, the president announced the appointment of Mr. Ernest Lefebvre about uh, eight or nine days ago to be the new Assistant Secretary of State for Humanitarian Affairs. Uh, Mr. Lefebvre is an avowed opponent of the legislation which we have passed over the years requiring human rights reports and requiring a cutoff of economic and military assistance to those who are gross violators. It is his position that we have no duty or no right to try to influence the internal affairs of other nations and that cutting off economic and military assistance from us based upon a human rights record constitutes internal interference. He has told, indeed, both the House and the Senate committees over these last two or three years in various bits of testimony that he believes it is wrong to tie our foreign aid, economic or military, uh, to how a country treats its people. Well, let me conclude this part of what I wanted to say tonight uh, by saying that I sincerely hope that we do not make the mistake of backsliding too far in this important area of human rights. In my judgment, progress has been made. In particular, there has been a geometric increase in the human rights awareness around the world. As a result, governments must, must now at least weigh the value of repression against the cost of international criticism. 